All right, let's get into our study this morning in the book of First Timothy. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of First Timothy. Uh, First Timothy is written by our Apostle Paul. We're studying verse by verse through our Apostle Paul's book of First Timothy. Now, remember what First Timothy is written for. It's to give instructions to you and I as members of the body of Christ in a local assembly. God has designed the body of Christ to work in a local assembly. He's never designed it so that it wouldn't, that people would just be off on their own. Now, sadly, in these last days, that's why Brian puts these uh, studies on, there are a lot of stranded believers who don't have a local assembly because faithful men are lacking. Ministers of, of the gospel of grace are not ministering the gospel of grace. They're they're members of the body, but they aren't doing this faithfully. And so if you have a faithful brother or or, or in the Lord and faithful brothers and sisters to fellowship with, that's a blessing that most people don't have, okay? Well, that's what Paul is going to talk about. We left off in chapter number two. So let's read a few verses and then uh, give thanks to the Father for the word. Look at at, uh, 1 Timothy chapter number two, verse one. Paul says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto a knowledge of the truth. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life given to us on Calvary's cross, Father. We thank you for his precious, innocent, uh, perfect shed blood for our sins. Father, we know that the only way we can even have this, this prayer to you today, right now, is because of the intercession of the Lord Jesus. He shed his blood. He sacrificed his life on that cross for us, Father. And we thank you that by grace through faith plus no works, we, are, we can receive his everlasting life as a free gift. But we also thank you for the holy word of God, Father, which teaches us how to, to, to walk pleasing to you, Father, and to have the life of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, manifest in our mortal flesh. Thank you, Father, for the local assembly that we have. We do pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who don't have the privilege and honor that we have. Uh, may, may your marvelous and wonderful grace strengthen them uh, to the best uh, uh, of, of your ability in, in, their, in their current situation. But we do thank you for this local assembly, Father. In these last days of grace, we know it's rare, but we thank you for this. And we thank you for uh, this time to study God's word, your word, Father. And we thank you in the name of your son, the precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so we're in a political season these days, right? And you see all the craziness. Um, I, I, have, I talk to 90-year-olds on a daily basis during the week, and they say they've, seen, they've never seen anything the way it, it's been. And, and, and what's happened is the morality of the world is getting worse and worse every day we go forth, okay? The world is on a collision course to the wrath of God. It's not going to get any better. It's going, to get in, it's going to get worse. But even in light of that, you see all the protests and people fighting and beating each other up over things. Well, that's the way the world does things, the right and unruly. Paul is going to show us as members of the body, how to do public worship together. And, and, and part of that is our attitude towards lost men, especially those in leadership. So if you look at verse number one, Paul says, I exhort therefore. And the therefore is he's telling Timothy to keep that word, pr- protect that word called the grace of God. And with that word, he says, I there, I, verse number one, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, you see that issue of supplying, uh, 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 prayers, that's keeping your soft heart towards other and, and going to God uh, um, about them, speaking to God about everything and, and that's on your heart. Intercessions, that's going bef- to God on behalf of another, okay? Interceding on their behalf. And he says, and giving of thanks. Now that might be hard because these heathen rulers we have ruling over us it's hard because of their bad policies, their ungodliness and so forth, and their, and their unrighteousness. But we, as the grace believer, are to give thanks, not for the man, the men in, 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 in the position, but for the position. God has designed government to protect us. Government's job is to, number one, keep their citizens safe. That's the number one thing. Not to, be, not to give out social services, although we, we are blessed to have that. 
in our country, but it's number one is to keep the citizens safe. And number two is to keep the grace believer free to worship the Lord Jesus. That's what God has made government for. Now, Satan's going to fight against that. And he's going to use as puppeteers these these uh, evil men and in power to stop that. But as we pray for them, the power of God helps that, that them to do what they're called to do. Hold your hand here. Go back to Romans chapter 13. Government's job is to protect its citizens and free the body of Christ to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at, um, look at uh, Romans chapter 13, if you will. In Romans chapter 13, Paul gives some similar instructions to the grace believer. And 1 Timothy is designed to teach the believer how to walk pleasing to God in this current uh, age of grace, dispensation of grace. Notice here, Romans 13 has to do with civil authorities, those who are in power. He's going to call them the powers that be. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul, see, notice it has something to do with, your, with, your, with who you truly are, your soul, be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. Okay, got to get this. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, he's not talking about the men. He's talking about the positions. When the Lord Jesus in John 20 was before Pontius Pilate, Pontius says, I have the power to release you or to crucify you. The Lord says, you have no power over me at all, except it be given from above. He says, verse number two, whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God. When you want to be anti-government and so forth. Now, we ain't talking about politics. We're talking about government. God says you're resisting his ordinance. But when you do that, God has a remedy for that. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, that's not damnation to hell if you're a believer. What that is, you're going to be punished. There's punishment. Verse number three. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. They're, they're designed to be a terror to evil, to, to restrain evil, right? Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Okay, you got to have that fear of that power because of God for conscience. We're going to see do that, which is good. And thou shalt have praise of the same. And here's what I want you to see in verse four, for he is a minister of God to thee for good. You know, if you watch some of these cop shows, especially uh, like the first 48 or something like that, every once in a while you see these detectives, homicide detectives, and, and, you, and you'll see they'll have um, they don't even know this. I, I doubt if they're saved, most of them. And they'll say we work for God. They have an understanding that their job is to go out there and restrain evil. He says, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, notice Paul is talking to every soul, he uses thee. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he, that's the, 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 the civil authority, he beareth not the sword in vain. Now, obviously, that was a time where they, had, they used swords. The, the equivalent today is armed power or guns and so forth they 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 they're to resist evil verse number four for he is the minister of god a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil so that's why god has set up human government or authority verse number five wherefore ye must needs be subject now, not, notice what Paul says, not only for wrath's sake, not only for wrath, because you'd be punished, but also for conscience sake, because it's the right thing to do based upon the word, okay? Then he goes on, that's why we pay taxes and so forth. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Um, when you give to the government and it goes to the services of the police force and all those law enforcement, it's to protect us. And that's the main reason God has human authority. Go back to 1 Timothy, if you will. And because of God's desire to have human authority, we're to pray for them, okay? We're to pray for these heathen that are in those positions. Go back to 1, uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 2. So he says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, asking God to supply and so forth, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And again, notice in verse two, he says, for kings, those are the, the, the supreme authority and for all that are in authority. Now, look why we do it. I know it's hard because you see those heathen ways and those ungodly, unrighteous men. But you want to pray to work with God to, to, to do what? 
that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life. Their number one role is to give us a quiet and peaceable living to keep us free from terror, okay? And notice quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Free the grace believer up to worship. And then in verse 3 he says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. When we do that, when we pray for these uh, men. Now, by the way, I want to say to the men, to the brothers in the Lord, the focus is primarily on the men because the men are supposed to lead in spiritual things, okay? But that doesn't preclude sisters in the Lord to pray. We see that all through the scriptures. Uh, women, uh, the women that Paul met in Acts 16, Lydia, and those ladies at Philippi, they were going to the, to the go, let me show you that. Go to uh, Acts 16, go to Acts 16. Now, he's going to focus on the men in 1 Timothy because this is public ministry. But it doesn't preclude sisters in the Lord. In fact, many of the so-called prayer warriors in Scripture are women. They go before the Lord. Look at Acts chapter 16, if you will, and verse number 12. Acts 16, verse 12. This is when our apostle went to Philippi, and he writes the book of Philippians to this assembly that, that begins here. Look at verse 12. Uh, Acts chapter 16 verse 12 and from thence to Philippi went Paul which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony so I'm talking about a Roman colony where they set up uh, a garrison of, of, of armed forces uh, many a retired arm, uh, uh, Roman forces were at this place and so they didn't have the Jews in there didn't let them have a, a, a um, synagogue it says in verse 12 and we were in that city abiding certain days now what I want you to see in verse 13 and on the Sabbath, we went out of the city. So they, le they left the city by a riverside. Now, I want you to see where prayer was wont to be made. So there was a group of women, actually. Notice it says, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted there. The point is, the Philippian church started by a number of women praying to God for some truth. And God sends the Apostle Paul to answer their prayer. And Lydia's house was the first congregation of Body of Christ members at Philippi. So, so I want you to see, although God puts the onus on men to lead, that doesn't preclude the women, that doesn't exclude the women from prayer. So go back to chapter number two of 1 Timothy. So we all can play our part. There's power in prayer. There's, there's spiritual power in prayer. You know, I think about it, prayer it runs interference to Satan's uh, uh, um, working in our lives. Okay, so we need to pray one for another. That's why I always start with that. Every time I write on this board, the first thing is prayer. There's power there. God has made that for us to be a part of what he's doing through prayer. Okay, look at verse 2 again. Uh, sorry, verse, verse uh, 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have, now notice, all men to be saved. But not just to be saved. God puts it part and parcel. They go together and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God's will is more than just you and I trust Christ for our soul salvation from hell. That's the start. That's where it starts. But he has a dual function. Uh, he wants you not only to be saved, but to come into the knowledge of the truth. And that's the mystery of Christ given to Paul. That's the doctrine according to godliness. That's Paul's doctrine. Why we have this assembly, Ryan and I were talking about it this morning. We only exist for one purpose. We're not here to boast your flesh. You, you're not going to get a huge, uh, you know, choir. We're not going to have no baptism. We're not here for the flesh. We're here to build up your inner man. And if that's what you want, we're here. Now, sadly, in these last days, most people won't endure sound doctrine. They don't want it. They're just going to fall off. have been seeing it as, as the days go by. That's fine. But if you want this truth, that's why we exist. Notice what Paul says. God's will is that all men be saved. God's going to do all he can to get his word out there. He has done that. But that people got to believe. And to come into a knowledge of the truth, people have to believe that. They have to trust what God says through the Apostle Paul in order to come into the knowledge of the truth. And that is the mystery of Christ. Look at verse 5. <clears throat> For there is how many gods? One God. The pagan culture around us believes in a lot, lots of gods. When I first moved here to California five years ago and started working at this job, I drove, it's, it's on uh, Madison and Garfield, there's the Neptune Society. 
And I was intrigued. I stopped my car and I just looked. The Neptune Society. They worship Neptune. The, the god of the oceans and waters, you know. And I say, wow, Lord, look at that. It's crazy. I felt like I was back in the Bible days in Ephesus. And you got all these different religions everywhere. You know, we were talking about, on Wednesday, we were talking about anytime you see stars, moons, suns on flags, or it, this represents uh, Allah's one of the, the, he's the moon god, one of the gods uh, of the Middle East, the moon god. God says, don't worship the stars, don't worship the moon, don't worship the sun. Worship the one who created that. And there's all these gods and these religions. Well, it's not our God. It's not our religion. We worship the true and living God. Notice he says, for there is one God. And that one God is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because notice what he says, and one mediator between God and men. And who is that? The man, Christ Jesus. He was a human being. He suffered for that privilege. His name was Jesus. By the way, one mediator between God and men. There are religions where... There's a man, he sits in a collar, and he, there's, he sits in a booth, and you go and you bow down to this dude on your knees, and you tell him all your sins. And he says, okay, do this, do this, many, do this. And he sits there, and, and you have to, you know, tell, he tells you what to do to be right with God. He's going to mediate between you and God. He said, God's word says, look at that verse again. There's one God and one mediator, one go between, between God and men. No co-mediators, no nothing. No priest is a mediator. By the way, you know, I, it says the man, Christ Jesus. This is one man. The man, Christ Jesus. You don't need to go to a man or to any woman, any goddess, any co-mediator. You go right to God the Father through one man, and that's Christ Jesus, the Lord Jesus. He's the only mediator. He's the only name under heaven, given, given under heaven uh, to men by where we must be saved. Jesus Christ. And can I tell you, these other religions, the religions of the, of the moon and the sun and the stars, they don't worship the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't go through him. They don't say he is the son of God. He is the son of God. And he's the only mediator. and He died for us. Notice in verse 6, speaking of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who gave himself a ransom. Now, when you think of a ransom, someone gets kidnapped and in order to get your loved one back, you have to pay the price and then they give them back, right? Well, why did Jesus Christ have to become a ransom? Because we were dead in our sins. We owed God a debt of sin. And he's the only way to get out of that debt of sin. Go to, um, go to Romans chapter 3, if you will. Go to Romans chapter 3. Every human being is born in debt. <laughs> they talk about in this political season our national debt and uh, they say man our children's children are gonna be paying this thing back it's true children are born into this world particularly our culture in our country into national debt it's a debt that there's no way we're gonna repay okay but that's that's in human terms there's a debt spiritually that every human being is born with and that has to do with the debt of sin you are separated from God as sinner now remember as, they're, as children, they're innocent. God forbid anything happened to our little ones over there with Krista. they all innocent before Almighty God, so they're going to go be with the Lord, okay? And at the rapture, if you're saved and you have a child, your child's going in a rapture with you. God's not leaving your child with your heathen uh, spouse or within this heathen world, okay? They're innocent because of the blood of Christ. He's the righteous judge, but they're still sinners. They're sti they still have a sin nature, don't they? Yes, they do. All you have to do is be around a child for a while, okay? They're innocent, though. God is gracious to them. But one day, that child becomes accountable to God as, a, as an adult, okay? Only God knows that age. There's no particular age. In Israel, it was 20 years old. From, age, from, being, from birth to age 19, there was no sacrifice needed to be offered on their behalf. God looked at them as innocent. And at age 20... The, the children of Israel had to begin offering a sacrifice. God held them accountable for their sins at 20. There's no particular age this, this, in this dispensation. Somebody could be 18 or 21, depending on the light that God gave them through their parents. Okay? But I want you to see what's going on. Everybody is still born a sinner. 
And although children are innocent and they die, they go be with the Lord in heaven. They'll go in the rapture if their parents are saved. But uh, one of their parents are saved. First Corinthians seven. But they still everybody has a debt they owe God. Look at chapter number three. Look at Romans chapter number three. And verse number 19. Let's go down to this verse. Look at Romans 3.19. <clears throat> Paul is going to talk about something that's a truth for today. Now we know what, that what things soever the law saith. That's what God gave the nation of Israel, the law. It saith to them who are under the law. At the time Paul wrote this, the temple was still up in effect. Israel was still operating under that law. But God gave them the law to condemn them. Notice that every mouth may be stopped, both Jew and Gentile. That's what he's talking about. And all the world may become guilty before God. Israel would read the law and they say, yep, that's about those heathen Gentiles. Paul, Paul and God says, no, that's about you, Israel. The, the, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law. You ever hear somebody say, you can go to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments or some type of rules and religious regu regulations? You can't. Notice this, therefore, by the deeds of the law, verse 20, there shall no flesh, both Jew, Jewish flesh or Gentile flesh, be justified or righteous in whose sight? God's sight. So why did God give the law to Israel? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. When God gave those Ten Commandments, it was to teach Israel that they needed a savior. That's what it is. Now, how did God change that? Well, when he saved the apostle Paul, Saul, Paul, verse 21. But now, that's where we live in the dispensation of grace. Let's read it. But now, the righteousness of God. You want God's righteousness? It's not going to be through the Ten Commandments. It's without the law is manifested. See, through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, God has given us the grace of God. It's without the law. Law and grace are opposites. You're not under the law. You're under grace, right? For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law. You're under grace. Romans 6, 14. Look at verse 21. But now, in the dispensation of grace, the righteousness of God. Do you want God's righteousness? That's the only way you're going to get into heaven. God doesn't grade on a, on a curve like a, a professor. He says you must have one, you, you need 100% righteousness, perfection. Well, the problem is none of us are perfect. And, but there was one perfect man, Jesus, and he died for you. And God says, if you want my righteousness, it's in my son. Christ is the end of the law. For, hold your hand there. Go, go a few pages to Romans 10. Look at Romans chapter 10. Look at verse 4. In fact, just look at, look at verse 1, just to give you the context. The nation of Israel thought that they could come to God based upon their own works. Every religion that you're going to hear about, whether it's Catholicism, Islam, all the religions, I read the Quran, there's, no, there's nothing about love of, of God in there. There's, I don't even think it mentions love. God, the, the Bible mentions love because Satan doesn't love you. He hates you and wants you to go to hell. And if you get saved, he wants you to lose your reward. God loves you. There's no mention of love in that book, the Quran. Religion tells you you need to do something. Grace says God did it for you. Let me show you this. Verse number uh, one, ch chapter 10 of Romans. Brethren, Paul writes, my heart's desire, the thing that his heart desired, and my prayer to God, he went to prayer on behalf of his nation. For Israel is that they might be saved. When Paul got saved, that was proof to Israel that God was done with them for, for a moment. Now, Paul was a zealous Jew. Saul of Tarsus, Acts 8, Acts 9. So he could bear them record. Look at verse 2. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. You're going to run into some religious people who are zealous, okay? They're zealous for, for, for their religion. When them Islamic extremists blow some, themselves and others, it's because they're zealous for their religion. They have a zeal of God, but not according to what? Knowledge. They don't have the knowledge of the truth. Which is one of his wills. That's exactly, that's what we looked at. That's right, knowledge of truth. Verse 3, for they being ignorant, and that's the thing, ignorant of God's righteousness. By the way, when you look at the word ignorant, that means they ignore it. 
it's out there, but you ignore it. You don't want it, see? It's not that they can't have it. They don't want it. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going, to, uh, going about to establish what? Their own righteousness. That's called self-righteousness. You're going to do it and not let the Lord Jesus do it. Have not, and, and by the way, the, the issue is always pride. They have not what? Submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Remember Paul says, but now the righteousness of God is manifested. Notice where it's at. Verse number four. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that what? Believeth. You know what God does now? When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God gives you his righteousness. It's not about your works. It's about what he did at Calvary. Go back to Romans 3. That's what he's saying in verse 21. Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law. It's now manifested today. God made it known. But it shouldn't have been any surprise to anyone being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets spoke about this Messiah to come, this righteous one, this just one. Israel should have known when Jesus was there, it's our Messiah. Some did. Nathaniel did. He's, he didn't even see a miracle. He heard them say something. He said, you're the Messiah. Thou art the Christ. Now, what did Messiah do? Look at verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of, thank you, of Jesus Christ. Because if you have any other version, perversion of the Bible, it's not going to say of Jesus. It's going to say in Jesus. And there's a big difference between the faith of Jesus and just faith in Jesus. One is his faith, and one has to do with our faith. The object of the faith of Jesus, his perfect faithfulness. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now, remember when we saw that God's will is that what? Some or all men? All. Calvinists believe just some, that there's, God has ordained some to salvation and in, in heaven and others to hell and damnation like he just chose before no God's wills at all men notice where Christ sacrificed verse 22 even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto who all but there's a catch and upon all it's available to every person but the only people who receive it they have to receive it how upon all them that believe you have to trust God's word you have to believe God cannot save you from anything unless you believe his word the, the power is in faith Hebrews eleven six. for without faith it is impossible to please God you have to believe his word all right for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile in context now this is a famous verse verse 23 for all have sinned both Jew and Gentile have sinned not fallen short, like the other versions, like you already up there and you fell. We're down here. God's up there. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. By the way, I might be better than somebody else. That person might be better than me as far as comparable righteousness, right? But when you compare yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ, we all fall. We all come short, right? We come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified. What's that next word? Freely, how? By his grace. When it says freely, that means there's nothing that he requires for you to do. You owe God a debt and he paid the debt. How, wouldn't that be nice? If somebody has some money, they, they say, give me all your credit card statements. What you want to do? I'm all embarrassed. I've been a mess. Okay, yep. Add them all up. Oh, man. $300,000, huh? Yeah. Boy, that's a big debt. Yeah. I'll be working all day. I can't. How about this? I love you so much. I'm going to pay that for you. What? Thank you. I love you, right? That's how we should be with the Lord. But what if, what if he did this then? After clearing the 300000 he says, here's another 500000 Put it in the bank. Put it in your pockets. Just be, just be wise with it. But here's some. You'd be like, thank you for lifting the burden. That's what God has done. We had a burden of debt that we could not pay. And the Lord Jesus Christ paid it. And then he says, but wait, there's more. He's willing to give you his same glory to share and reign in the heavenly places with his father. That's the grace of God. Notice what it says. Verse number 24, being justified. Don't ever miss that word freely. 
Don't let religion come and say, you got to do this. You got to do that. You must do this. Don't do that. No, you say, I'm justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in who? Christ Jesus. See, the redemption. He, he's our redeemer. He redeemed us. Um, there's a show called Roots Out. It was from the 70s, but they got a new one. And, 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 and if you were enslaved, if you were enslaved, someone rich would have to come and redeem you out there. And so another rich person could come, buy you from your slave master, and then he could set you free. That's what Jesus did. He bought us from the slave pit of sin. He says, I'll pay the debt. Here, give me that slave. He's mine. Okay. Now, now you're free. That's what Jesus does. Notice, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, verse 25, whom God... God the Father has set forth. The person he put out there is Christ to be a propitiation. That word propitiation, that means a fully satisfying payment. You owe your creditors 300000 He got a check for 300000 Here it is. It's fully satisfying your debt. That's what the Lord did spiritually. Okay? Let's keep going. Through faith in his blood. God has faith in the precious blood of Christ, and we are to have it too. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus that saves. And he says in verse 25, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. In time past, before the dispensation of grace, God remitted the sins of Old Testament saints. Adam, he had them all for sacrifices. Now, really, the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sins from human beings. We're, we are a higher being. We're made in the image of God. But God just forbeared in long suffering until the Lord Jesus came. He knew 4,000 years after Adam, Jesus Christ would come, live a perfect life under that righteous law, and then shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. And he did it for us. Let's look at it. Verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. God was righteous to remit those sins, even though it was just bulls and goats. Because he knew that man would come, right? Look, declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Forbearance of God. God forbeared the sins of the Old Testament saints. He allowed them the ordinance of blood of animals, knowing Jesus Christ would come. That's, grace. That's the grace of God. The mercy of God is what. Look at verse 26. To declare. And when Paul says, I say, this is a due time. I didn't even do my, my thing. This is a due time testimony. To declare, let's look at it, verse 26, I say, that's Paul, at this what? Time. See, it's a dispensational issue. Nobody knew this before Paul. God didn't reveal this to the Old Testament prophets and, and saints. I say at this time, that's why you need to rightly divide. If you don't understand who your apostle is, you'll never understand the Bible and you'll never please God. If you don't rightly divide and know who, who your apostle Paul is and know his doctrine, you'll never please God. Notice what he says. To declare, I say at this time, God has a truth for today. His righteousness, that he might be just, just for, 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 for remitting, their, uh, remitting their sins, and the justifier in the future, those who of him which believeth in Jesus. The point is, now God can just justify a man when you believe on the Lord Jesus. You know, Satan wants to hide that from you. All those religions say, hey, you got to do all these things to please God. And it makes some people feel good in their flesh. Look how pious I am. Look how religious I am. God says, that's not what I want. I, that's pride. I want you to believe, trust my son and trust his word through the Apostle Paul. That's what pleases God. Let's go back. So he talks about, go back to 1 Timothy. First, by the way, you're not going to hear this a lot in this dispensation of grace. I'm telling you. <laughs> we were just talking. You turn on Christian radio, and if you know the truth rightly divided, you can't sit through that nonsense more than about five minutes. I could barely last 30 seconds listening to that nonsense. They spend big money to be on the radio and TV. They're bamboozling and, and, and stealing from people, making them pay tithes and offerings so that they can, for filthy lucre's sake, for the, for the minister, and he's all rich and got this car, these suits, that jet, G, G6 and stuff, some fool had that people. TV, radio, expensive. 
They're extorting money from people, telling them this is what God wants you to do, and they're lying to them. Look what he says over in 1 Timothy chapter number 2. Verse number 6, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom, he paid the price. Now, you see where it says, for all to be testified in due time. Now go with me to a couple of passages. Get um, Matthew chapter 20 and Mark chapter 10. Let's when you rightly divide God's word, you compare and contrast the things that differ, right? You look at it. You say, okay, Paul says this, but somewhere in the Bible it might be something different. Well, let me show you that. Paul says he gave himself a ransom for all. Look at Matthew chapter 20, if you will. So if you go back to the four gospels, which most churches teach out of, Matthew chapter 20. By the way, 1 Timothy is the instructions for the local assembly. People go back to Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount and all that stuff, but that's the instruction to the kingdom church. You've got to rightly divide. That's Israel's church for this earth, the kingdom church. The body of Christ is God's church for the heavens, the heavenly places. Paul instructs us. Now, you, you remember what he says? He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Let me show you something contrary to that. What I tell you, Matthew 20, and look at verse 28, Matthew 20, 28. Let's start at verse 20. <laughs> look at verse 24. Let me give you the context of it, okay? Watch this. As might happen, when, when you're talking about, I'm going to reign as a king, if Jesus is saying, I'm going to reign one day, we're going to get these Romans off our back, we're going to get all these Gentiles off our land, I'm going to be king, and you guys, you 12, are going to be my princes. You're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes. So obviously they are thinking, okay, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? That's how men think. Am I going to be greater than that guy? Is he going to be greater than me? I, you know what the Lord said? Comparing Co exactly. Comparing themselves among themselves, which Paul says is not wise. So here it is. Verse number. Uh, go, go back to tw let's go back to 20. Because this is even funnier, because their mama came and asked them. Watch this. I love mama. I love mamas. Mamas are always worried about their boys, sometimes, unless they got inordinate affection, you know. But can I say something? Not my mama. We know some people, though. This woman comes to talk to the Lord Jesus about her sons. Let's look at it. Verse 20, Matthew 20, 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children, with her sons. That's James, James and John, okay? Sons of Zebedee, okay? Worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. So she comes, she says, Oh dear Lord, I have one request. He says, Speak on, woman, what do you have? And she wants to make sure her sons are going to be taken care of in the kingdom, that they're going to have a high position. Verse 21. And he said, By the way, it says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons. They said, Mom, why don't you go ask them? All right, we ain't asking. We can't talk to them like that. You're, you're, the, you're the softer vessel. You can talk to him. He never, you know, unless you're a Gentile woman, he won't talk to you. But he'll talk to a Jewish woman. Watch this. Verse 21, he said unto her, what wilt thou? So he's very gracious to this Jewish woman. He says, what, what can I do for you? And she said unto him, grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. So she was a believer. She says, can you make sure that my sons have the, the power, one on your right, one on your left? But she didn't know what she's asking. Because in order to have that high power, you must suffer for his sake. So watch what he tells us. Verse number 22, but Jesus answered and said, ye know not what ye ask. She had no clue what she was asking. Are ye able, and he's talking to the boys now, are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? Talking about his suffering. And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, his suffering, his passion, his death. They say unto him, we are able. They didn't have a clue. They didn't have a clue. Because check this out, everybody. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Judas led those hundreds of men to, receive, to get the Lord Jesus, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall scatter, they all ran away from him. You know, what I, I tell people, the moment you say, I'm going to do this for the Lord, I'm going to do that, I'm, I'm never going to follow, I'm just, Satan says, oh, really? Hmm. 
And he goes before the Lord and says, let me sift them as wheat. Let me, let me, check, let me try them. Got to be, be careful. Because don't give Satan that challenge. I've heard people, 20 years of ministry, people say, oh, man, I had one guy say, oh, Brother Ron, this is the best thing ever. I, it, I'll never leave that thing. I ain't see the guy ever since. Had a woman, she was coming here and she said, oh, this is the truth. I, I'm the guy to have it. This is it. And then she gone. Because as soon as you say that, Satan says, oh, really, then? No, you got to remember this. Verse 23, and he said unto them, ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. Okay. Says so you're going to suffer. But then he gives them even more truth. It's not his. It's not him who decides who, who goes where. It's the father. And whether it's them, when the body of Christ goes to the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord Jesus, he judges all of us. But it's the father when he hands us over to the father before he comes out and pours his wrath and his kingdom on the earth. He says the father is the one who determines where we're going to be in the kingdom, in the heavenly kingdom. Same with the earthly kingdom. Look at verse 23. But to sit on my right hand and on my left, the two positions of, of power, it is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. Everybody see that? God the Father determines that. Even though the Lord judges, then God the Father makes the final determination. Now look at verse 24. So these two dudes go with their mommy to talk to the Lord. And so the other ten are thinking like, what about us? Are we chopped liver? That's what they're thinking. Look, look, at the, look how they reacted. And when the ten heard it, the other ten apostles, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Wow. Including Judas, that's right. Judas, what is Judas indignant about? He's going to betray the Lord. Sucker. Verse 25. But Jesus called them unto him and said, and watch what he says. You all know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. And they that are great exercise, they, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. He says, look at the Gentiles. They, they sit over people and they, and they, they have all this dominion and, and they're just like despicable and they treat, them, treat their, their, their people back. He goes, they, they use power. Uh, it's an old saying, power corrupts, right? And absolute power corrupts absolutely because of sin. And the Lord says, that's how the Gentiles do it. And that's not how it is in the kingdom. Look at verse 26. But it shall not be so among you. And by the way, this is an interdispensational principle. Everybody watch this. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Do you know that same principle apply? You, you can have a sense of where you're going to be. How, how are you served? Here's a, here's, a, here's a hint. In the proximity, how you're serving your brothers and sisters in Christ, the, the saints now. It will affect your serve, where you're going to serve in God's kingdom. So if you're busy serving your brothers and sisters, you got a good sense that you're going to be, a, a, be, be a, have some great authority there. Just look what he says. Verse 26, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. You know, that's why the Lord Jesus in the book of John, in our study of John, he's going to get on his hands and knees. He's God in the flesh. He gets on his hands and knees and he washes the disciples feet. And he says, I want you guys to remember this. This is how you must serve to be great. I'm on my knees cleaning your dirty feet and I'm going to be the greatest. He said, that's the attitude. So I can tell you, you can get a hint of where you fit in God's kingdom. How are you worshiping and serving the Lord and the saints in the, in the, in the, in the truth? of the mystery okay so if you feel like you're lacking get busy serving grow in the doctrine that's the work of faith the labor of love okay all right let's keep going now he's going to use himself as the as the ensample for them even as the son of man that's what he calls himself that's a messianic title came not to be ministered unto why did jesus come but to minister during his earthly ministry he served others is the point and to give his life a ransom for all to be. Oh, did I read that wrong? 
Oh, that says many. Oh, man. Let's go check another one. Hold on. Go to Mark chapter 10. Maybe that one says all. Mark chapter 10. Look at for, for, verse 45. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Now in Mark, it doesn't mention their mama. Verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever. <laughs> Check this out. They knew how benevolent Jesus was. So they were presuming on his graciousness. Look, look, how, look what they say. Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we desire. They came and said, won't you do us this favor? We, just do this for us. He says, what's that? Verse 36. He said unto them, what would ye that I should do for you? Y'all see his graciousness? Mark shows him as the servant. And, and how he asked them a question. Yes, he asked he questions. Ah, he asked questions. He That's asked right. Question with the expectation that they will make a right or a wrong answer. That's why God asked Adam, where art thou? Did you eat of the fruit? Who told you you were naked? God asked questions. He wants them to think it through. All right, let's keep going. Verse 37. They said unto him, grant us that we may sit one on thy right hand, on any other on thy left hand, in thy glory. That's the kingdom. Verse 38, and, but Jesus said unto them, ye know not what ye ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Speaking of his suffering and his death. Verse 39, and they said unto him, we can. Jesus said unto them, ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. And with the baptism that I am baptized with, shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it is, shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And he's, he's talking about. God already knows who's going to do what, and he's, gonna, he's got it ready. Verse 41, and when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him. He's trying to quell this now. He's going to say, wait a minute. Let's, let's, we're not going to have this dissension, so here we go. Ye know, verse 42, that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever, you, now watch this, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the what? Servant of all. Humility, humble servant. Can I show you something about Solomon? Solomon ruled in God's wisdom with humility for the most part. He had, he had a stretch where he got out of control with ladies. He had, a, he had 700 wives and 300 mistress, uh, concubines, mistresses. That led him astray because many of them were Gentiles. But Solomon, he was a benevolent ruler. After his death, his son, one of his sons, began to reign. And the people says, will you reign like your father? We love your father. We will we, we'll submit to you and everything. He says, no, I'm going to be stricter than my father. I'm going to be harsh on you. And the people rebelled against him. And that's how the pride of their, their, their power was broken. That's why the kingdom split. And not just Israel became Israel and Judah because of the, the evilness of one of his sons who was too strict on the people. And they rebelled against him. Had he been that servant leader king, his people would have loved him. That's what Solomon's wise man told him. He says, look, we were in your father's cabinet Here's what he did. You need to do it the way he did it, and we'll keep peace. They re, he, re, they, he rejected the counsel of those wise uh, men of Solomon, and you know what happened? He lost his uh, kingdom, most of his kingdom. Here's the point. Verse number 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto. Jesus didn't come and say, I'm king of heaven and earth. Get down, worship me, serve me, do what I want. He said, what do you want? I'm going to tell you, just in my years of service in the ministry, that's the truth. You, you give your life to serving the Lord by serving his saints. You, you have a great idea of where you're going to be there. All of us can do it, every one of us. That's what the local assembly is for. And those who don't have it and they're part of us, through the, they give with their prayers and their support. That's a way to be a part of that. That's what he's saying. But notice verse 245, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and then after ministering, he's going to die for him. Watch this. And to give his life a ransom for many. Now, I want you to see when Paul writes it, he says a ransom for how many? All. 
when the Lord says it, it's a ransom for it's right. That's it. Um, for, for, the, for, the, for the Jews in general, right, of, of, of all of Israel, Jesus wants to save them. And obviously those who trust him, the little flock, ends up being the ones who he redeems. But he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And when you rightly divide the word, when Jesus says many, he's focused on one people, the house of Israel. Okay? But Paul is not just focused on one nation. His ministry is for all nations. Let's go back there as we come down to the end. Go back, go back to 1 Timothy. So you have to rightly divide this. If, you, if you're reading the Gospels, the Lord will say many. He's focused on one people. But when he saved Paul, he now sends out this ransom to all men, both Jew and Gentile. All right, go back to 1 Timothy. Verse number 6, who gave himself a ransom for all, but notice, to be testified in due time. This issue of testifying in due time, God had a particular time in human history. He wanted this to be revealed. Everybody get this? Nobody before Paul knew this information. Even the prophet says that he would give his life for the nation of Israel. When you rightly divide, when Paul comes, God begins to reveal that it's not just for Israel, but for all men. And not just through Israel's rise. God's going to deal with the Gentiles through Israel's rise in the earthly kingdom, okay? When Jesus Christ comes, he's going to bless Israel. Through you and your seed shall all the families and nations of the earth be blessed, right? But the mystery is, it's through not the rise of Israel, but through the what? Through the fall of Israel. Salvation has come unto us Gentiles. That's the grace of God. That's the mystery. That's part of the mystery, right? Yep, to, to provoke them to emulation, to jealousy. That's right. To come on over here, all right? All right, now, we're coming down to end, but I want you to see this issue of due time. Let's look at two passages about this. Go to get Romans chapter 5 and Titus chapter number 1. Yeah, let's look at Romans 5 and Titus 1, then we'll end. Romans 5 and Titus 1. The reason I said before is you'll, you'll never please God if you don't understand who Paul is because God's instructions for you and me, the knowledge of the truth is found only in Paul's epistles for you and I today as members of the body. The body of Christ did not exist before the Apostle Paul. We saw that last week in me first. Jesus Christ began the body of Christ with the salvation of Saul Paul. Until this dispensation of grace ends, everybody has to get saved the same way by grace through faith and Everyone has to listen to the Apostle Paul. He's, he's the spokesman for God. Because that's, that's the one new man. That's the one new man, the There's body of Christ. one new man in the Old Testament. Except, well, except Adam. Well, except Adam. Yeah. Right, and, and, but I see what you mean. There's no, there's no vessel called the body of Christ, that one new man. Obviously, on the earth, Adam was the one new man to do something in prophecy. Christ is the one new man for the mystery. But that, you're right, Matthew, that's right. God is doing something new today. It's new. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. God's doing something different today. All right, Romans chapter number five, if you will. Oh, I love this. Let's, let's read chapter five, verse one. Therefore being justified, how? By faith. We receive that righteousness by faith. Let me ask you this. Answer in your mind. Have I, say, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you trusted the Lord Jesus, what he did on the cross for you alone? In your mind, thank you. Your mind's outside. Okay, now he's playing. Yes, you have. Then you're justified. You have righteousness. You have peace. Look, therefore being justified, how? By faith, you believe, right? We have peace with God, how? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. God is no longer at war with you. He loves you. He's with you. You have peace with God. Trust that. Religion won't let you have peace with God. A religion of peace is no religion of peace, but the grace of God, that's where the peace is. Religion says, if you don't do it this way, our way, we're going to destroy you. We're going to hurt you. We're going to harm you. When you trust Christ shed blood, you have peace with God. That's a norm. By, by, what, by the way, there's more. Verse 2. By whom also, by our Lord, we have, when that, that word access that means here's a door, 
and you can open that door, but you got to open it by faith. We have access by faith. That's our walk into this grace wherein we stand. You see, you stand in God's grace. Don't go back under to a religious system. Stand in God's grace and rejoice in hope of the what? Glory. You can reign with God in his kingdom if you stay in this truth. Verse three. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. What happens when Satan brings those problems your way? You know that tribulation worketh patience. That's trusting God's word and patience experience. You know you can relax and understand that it's all working out for God's glory and yours. And experience hope. You say, yep, I know I'm going to reign with the Lord. Verse 5, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. The Holy Ghost with the word of God gives you that strength of heart, strengthens you. For when we were yet without strength, he's saying look at when you didn't have strength as a lost person. In what time? Due time Christ died for the ungodly. This, was, uh, this is something that God had set up and then it was fulfilled. Verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. He doesn't need anybody being, the, the, uh, I, I've, not, I've not come to, to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. There might be some person out there you like enough and, and step in the way of a bullet or something, right? You might die for him. But what did God do? Verse 8, but God commendeth. He proved and demonstrated his love in a real tangible way. How? His love toward us. And that while we were yet or still what? Sinners. When people find out that I'm a, a minister or a pastor, they say, oh, Brother Ron, oh, I need to go back to church. I say, I, I didn't tell you that. You need to get saved, fool. But anyway, that's how I feel. That's what I say in my head. I'm kind to them. I don't say it like that. You know what I say? Oh, don't worry. Oh, Brother Ron, I got to clean up. Man, I got to stop doing this. Man, I'm smoking a little bit, doing my thing, you know. I had a guy tell me. He's like, I got, I'm, got too much stuff going on, man. I go. What they got to do with you getting saved? God didn't tell you to clean up stuff and then get saved. He'd say, get saved and I'll clean you up. I can't go to the hospital. I'm too sick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's good. Ryan's good with that. Well, that's what he's saying. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, still sinners, Christ died for us. Last verse. Go over to Titus chapter 1. And over the course of Paul's ministry, over the course of 30 years, the Lord Jesus would appear to Paul and give him more and more truth called the revelation of the mystery. All right, we got to end. Go over to Paul, uh, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant. Remember we're talking about a servant? Paul's going to have whatever the highest position in that kingdom he's going to have, but not just him. Maybe we'll, we'll end with that. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, that has to do with the, 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 the issue of the body of Christ, and the acknowledging of the truth, the come unto an, a knowledge of the truth. To acknowledge means to uh, accept and, pro and proclaim that truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, that has to do with that, 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 that hope of glory, that reigning, which God that cannot lie promised when? Before the world began. Before he made anything, he already made this promise. But hath in due times, you see, that's multiple, manifested his word through preaching, that's warning and teaching, which is committed unto who? Paul, according to the commandment of God our Savior. The point is, this due time testimony, this due time testimony, it was the mystery given to the apostle over the course of 30 years, visions and revelations. We're going to see that in our Galatians study on Wednesday. And it is the information that God wants you to know it. Ask yourself, do I know this information in the 13 letters of Paul? This man wrote 13 letters. Moses wrote five. John wrote five. Paul wrote three more than both of them combined. The point is, you need to know this information. This is what we're going to be judged on, the judgment seat of Christ. When, you get, when we go to heaven, that's what's next, the judgment seat of Christ. And he's going to see, do you know this information? If you don't, that's what it's called, redeeming the time. The work of faith, the labor of love, serving, the patient hope. Let's end over in 2 Timothy 4. Look at that. Paul, at the end of his life, says this. Verse number 6. This is a good way to go out. 
for I am now, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 6, for I am now ready to be offered. He saw himself as a, as a, as a, as a, as a drink offering, as it were, a sacrifice. And the time of my departure is at hand. I'm already dreading going to the airport next week or the week after. I heard it's been some lines three hours long, especially in my hometown, O'Hare Airport in Chicago. Yeah, you are. We're going to get there early. Thank you, Mother. He said, the time of my departure, when the soul is leaving, it's always departing, is at hand. I have fought a good fight. He can notice because the Lord told him. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That's the doctrine. Now, when he did that, look what he, he, can, he knows is going to happen. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. That's faith and love. A crown of righteousness, which the Lord... And what is the Lord? The righteous judge shall give me at that day. That's the judgment seat. But remember I said Paul will get that high position, but it's not just reserved for Paul. There are multiple thrones. Let me show you this. Well, Colossians 1, 16 says there's thrones. Henceforth, verse 8, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not unto me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. And that appearing is that message given to Paul, chapter 1. If you love this message of grace, God has something great in store for you. But you got to love it. And when you love something, you spend time with it. If you love TV, you're going to watch TV. If you love a person, you're going to spend time. You're going to do what you love. And what God's saying is, do you love anything more than me and my word? I hope the answer is no. And if, if it's anything else, redeem that time. We're going to help you with that, okay? If you're listening and you haven't trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have that assurity that you're going to go to heaven when you die, don't waste time. It's freely given by his grace. Trust him. God will save you right now. And if you've been wasting your time and this vapor, right, use that word vapor. Our life is like a vapor compared to what's in store. Redeem that time. The time is short. The Lord's coming soon. We need to be ready for and be found faithful. We'll help you with that, all right? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. Thank you, Holy Father, for your son. May our appreciation of the Lord Jesus grow greater and greater each day. May the things of this world become strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. May we focus upon the things that he delights in, that he values and esteems. May we develop his mind through the mystery of Christ given to our apostle. Thank you for your holy scriptures, Father. We know that most man on, human beings on earth don't appreciate it. It's here for the world, but they want to be in man's wisdom. But may we, as your, your sons and daughters, Father, trust the word of our Father, grow in the word of our Father, Stand and proclaim the word of our Father. Stand for and proclaim. Thank you for this time together, Father. Thank you that we can get into the word together. I thank you for these saints. Every day I'm, I, I hear from saints who don't even have one other person to talk to about these things. Let us not ever take that for granted. Father, as we have our Q&A, we, we ask you bless that time together as well. Give us great insight and understanding and a greater appreciation of your son. We thank you in his precious name. Amen.